Good evening, and thanks for joining today's Learn and Share conference call. I'm Russ Derry, Director of Education for Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan, and I'll be moderating this discussion. The topic for this evening is Epilepsy and Employment, How Vocational Rehabilitation Can Help. And we're pleased to have as our speaker, Javon Bain, who is a vocational rehab counselor for Michigan Rehabilitation Services. And we're also happy to welcome her colleagues, Adriza Caesar and Nasha Ely, who will be sharing their insights on a few questions as well. Um, so could each of you briefly introduce yourself, talk a little bit about the work you do, and, and describe your experience with this topic? Uh, Jovan, do you want to start? Sure. Thanks, Russ. I want to first thank you for inviting us to participate in this discussion this evening. I'm really excited to be here. Um, as Russ said, I am Jovan Bain. I'm a vocational rehabilitation counselor. I've been working in this capacity for almost two years with MRS, and before this, I worked as a social worker for about eight years, helping people with disabilities in a hospital and outpatient setting to obtain supports and resources that they needed to maintain their health, maintain employment, and support themselves and their families. So thanks again for having me. Great. And Adriza? Hi, um, good evening everyone. My name is Adresa Caesar and I am the Michigan Rehabilitation Service Oak Park uh, Site Manager, Oak Park Office Site Manager um, in Oakland County. I have been with uh, Michigan Rehabilitation Services for 15 years um, and I have uh, serviced and uh, supervised um, counselors um, who oversee a various and variety of disabilities, um, and Javon will speak to the educational uh, requirements of our um, staff later, um, but I um, am near and dear because I got my master's degree right in rehab counseling, so this is my wheelhouse, and I'm looking forward to um, discussing this um, with everyone this evening. Okay, great. And Nasha? Hi, my name is Nashi Ely. I've been with MRS for 14 years. Um, I was a VR counselor in the Oak Park office in Oakland County for 10, and I currently work as a business relations consultant with the business uh, network division within MRS, and I've been in this position uh, for four years. Um, in my role, I work with the business customer, which is our dual customer, in assisting them to be hire ready for uh, our customers with disabilities. We assist with um, ADA training, really disability and inclusion efforts, whether that's developing them, um, ERGs, return to work situations, retention cases, anything as it relates to maintaining or uh, supporting the business in hiring or uh, maintaining employees that have disabilities. Um, I'll probably get a little bit deeper into what I do a little bit later, but a lot of partnerships with businesses, um, as well as working with the district offices to try to coordinate some of the relationships that we have with businesses so that the customer, job seeker customers can move into positions that are available. Okay. Sounds great. All right. So can you start by giving us a quick overview of Michigan Rehabilitation Services? Sure, great. Hello, everyone. It's, again, it's Adresa Caesar. Um, the state of Michigan is home to over 1.3 million citizens with a disability. Let that sink in for a moment. Uh, Michigan Rehabilitation Services is a state of Michigan uh, vocational rehabilitation agency. We assist individuals with various disabilities prepare for, obtain, and maintain employment. We serve two customers, as uh, Ms. Ely uh, referenced earlier. We serve our VR counselors, and we serve our business customer, which Ms. Ely will talk about um, later on. State VR started over 100 years ago, and one cool fact is that we just celebrated 100 years of VR, woo, with a wonderful virtual celebration with agencies from across the nation. When we look at the organizational structure, 
um, of our agency and our funding. We're a governmental agency and we're funded by uh, the federal government and we have our stakeholders um, with our state collaboration partners and our um, nonprofit community organizations that also um, collaborate with us as well. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so vocational rehab rehabilitation counselors are the heart and soul of MRS. Uh, and I, I'm going to, I'll say MRS for, for, from now on rather than the full Michigan Rehabilitation Services. But um, can you describe the types of training vocational rehab counselors receive and the skills that they are able to offer to clients? I'm sure. Um, this is Jovan. I can answer that. Our counselors are master's level counselors. Uh, they come from various backgrounds. They have education and training in career counseling, vocation, uh, vocational evaluation, job placement, community resources, and other re um, other areas related to employment. Okay. Anyone else want to add anything to that? This is not sure. Um, yeah. Yep, there are other specialties in human services can include uh, masters in psychology, special education, uh, guidance and counseling, like Javon mentioned, and also vocational rehabilitation counseling. And there are some other ones that fall under the civil service guidelines for um, a candidate to work for our agency. Okay, great. So how is someone deemed eligible for services um, for, at, through Michigan Rehabilitation Services? Okay, uh, this is Jovan. I can answer that. Um, after a person completes the application process, the counselor will work with them to evaluate the disability and their need for agency services. You see, determining eligibility helps us to identify and understand that person's disability-related limitations and any barriers they have to employment. Having this knowledge um, about the person's limitations or barriers is really important in developing that employment plan. So to become eligible, the applicant must have an existing disability, which is a physical or mental impairment that results in a substantial barrier to employment, and the person requires MRS services to obtain a job, keep a job, advance in employment, or regain employment. In other words, help from this agency is essential to the person's employment. And lastly, the person needs to be able to benefit from vocational rehabilitation services that will lead to employment. So how do we do that? How do we determine eligibility? The, the counselor is going to work with um, the customer to obtain medical records regarding the disability. So we can get that from the person's treating provider or the person may be asked to take part in a medical, psychological, or physical evaluation to obtain additional information. Um, the counselor also work with them to learn more about that disability um, and the related barriers, how any problems they've had in the past um, obtaining or maintaining employment. So any um, barriers that pose any problems to suitable work for him in their work history, their education, also taking into consideration their abilities and their capabilities. So once a person becomes an MRS customer, eligibility is continually reviewed with them. So there's quite a bit that goes into determining eligibility. In most cases, that determination can be made within 60 days. Now, if there is a delay, the counselor will notify the person that a decision can't be made within that 60-day time frame, and the counselor requests an agreement to an extension. Okay. Now, you mentioned an application process. Is, is applica an application separate from the eligibility determination process? Or, um, yes. Okay. Yes, the application process is when the counselor and the applicant sit down to discuss what, um, what services MRS provides, what the expectations are of the customer, what their needs are, so they get an idea of what in a nutshell, what they're what they're getting into, what the expectations are in participation and the partnership that's involved. 
and then they fill out an application. Anyone can apply for services, but then, you know, you have to determine eligibility. So we do we do discuss that in the beginning, that um, it's not an entitlement program, but that you do have to apply for the services and be determined um, eligible. Mm-hmm. And is that application filled out in in an office and like face to face or is it filled out via mail or online or are there multiple options? There are multiple options. So we do have a website where you can go online and ex- and access the application. Um, right now we are working remotely so um, we used to be able to go right into the office and fill out an application as well. But now you can um, obtain the application online or have the application mailed to you or emailed to you, and it can be um, it can be filled out electronically and sent right directly to MRS for processing. Right, right. So it seems like there's there there must be a fair amount of subjectivity involved in determining eligibility because it's not a you know very uh, clearly defined uh, uh, factors that are that are used. So, um, can you talk a little bit about that subjectivity? And like, if if you get an unfavorable uh, eligibility determination, is there an appeal process, or can you see a different vocational rehab counselor? I guess you talk a little bit more about that. Well, hello. Yes, this is Adrisa. Uh, Applicants and eligible individuals, or if appropriate, their representatives, have the right to appeal decisions of Michigan Rehabilitation Service personnel, which they are dissatisfied regarding the provision of services. Also, um, throughout the process, customers um, can work with an advocate from the Client Assistance Program through Michigan Protective and Advocacy Services and they can have them uh, be along for the uh, process as well to help guide them and um, advocate on their behalf regarding decisions that are made in their vocational rehabilitation program. But we always want to appeal to anyone that if you um, are dissatisfied or you have any concern with your case, um, please definitely bring that up with the overseeing site manager um, so that uh, some uh, mediation can be handled at the early on in the process when there is a concern. Okay, great. And, and one thing I'd forgotten to ask uh, after the, and regarding the kind of the structure of Michigan Rehabilitation Services, um, what are, how are the offices, the local offices broken up? Are they by city, by county? Are they different for densely populated areas versus remote rural 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 areas or how how does that work? Yes, most definitely. For example, when you're looking at um, the more uh, rural, uh, remote, um, and not working remote, but more remote areas, you may have one um, MRS um, office for uh, a particular maybe 50 to 100 uh, square miles, whereas um, here in the southeast, um, division, you have, uh, let's take a more populated uh, area such as Detroit. Uh, you have several offices within Detroit that all service the residents of Detroit. Um, um, myself, um, Javon, and Nasha, we represent Oakland County. In Oakland County, within Oakland County, we have two offices. We have a northern Oakland County office, which is housed in Pontiac. Uh, Michigan, and we have a southern Oakland County office, which is housed under uh, housed in um, Oak Park. Okay, great. Um, so, can you give um, maybe three examples of people with epilepsy? Um, one who's maybe not disabled enough to qualify for services, one who qualifies, and one whose disability may be too severe and might be referred instead to maybe like Social Security Administration for disability benefits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll definitely speak to that. Um, we always want to appeal to everyone at any process, uh, step in the process, if there is question to your eligibility or um, the customer is found to be ineligible for services, 
this um, will be discussed uh, with the customer and should bring and they should bring their concerns to their MRS counselor. Um, and the MRS counselor fully assesses eligibility. And your um, you may tire of hearing me saying this, but our services are very individualized. And so, an example of someone who um, may have been found um, eligible or qualified for disability may differ for someone who's um, not found eligible. But again, that is all determined in the eligibility process. And if they have any, if the customer has any concerns about their eligibility, to definitely contact their counselor and again discuss that with their overseeing site manager for mediation. And with respect to Social Security, many of our customers are successfully looking for work while applying for or receiving Social Security benefits. Receiving Social Security benefits does not preclude one from applying for or going through the program. However, if someone makes the informed choice that they would uh, like to um, receive Social Security benefits um, in the process, then our MRS counselors can definitely uh, provide them with that resource and, um, and give them some information on how they can uh, apply for Social Security benefits. So I definitely want to uh, appeal to the audience that our services are very individualized and there is not one prescriptive scenario and every scenario is different. And uh, I, I'm really, uh, you know, excited about working for Michigan Rehab Services because it keeps us fresh because every situation is so different. Right, that makes sense. Um, so, and, and it is good to know that um, you can be receiving Social Security disability benefits and still um, use Michigan Rehabilitation Services perhaps as a transition back to work and, uh, and mm -hmm. off of disability benefits. So, okay. So, um, once a person is determined to be eligible, the next step is to decide upon an employment goal. Can you discuss some of the factors and assessments that might go into this decision? Yeah, hi, this is Reese again. Once our customer is determined eligible for services, as uh, Javon so eloquently and articulated, and greatly articulated for everyone, um, the customer will participate in ongoing vocational guidance and counseling. We call it a team and a partner. Um, we were, um, the agency was very, um, you know, uh, strategic with calling our customers a customer. Um, they've been participants, they've been clients, but it is a partnership. And so um, in that guidance and counseling and the partnership and developing a plan, um, we're considering employment factors such as strengths and abilities. We want to hear the customer's um, interest, their informed choice, what concerns to employment do they have, um, and uh, what what abilities, um, skills, abilities, capabilities are they bringing um, in there? And then what other resources can we consider along the way um, with that vocational, um, you know, needs assessment? Based on the individual nature of our program, we may consider one's educational attainment, or we may ask the customer to participate in further assessment to explore an appropriate vocational goal. But again, it's very individualized and um, not prescriptive, and uh, one person may benefit from um, having one service and the other um, may not need that service because they may not just be in that phase of their employment um, or um, even preparing for employment at that time. Right, and now is, is there ever a point at which you request um, uh, either a letter or medical records from, uh, you know, from a, a customer's neurologist or other physician um, to um, further understand the nature of their health condition or disability? Yes, we do. Uh, in part of that vocational assessment, we look at existing um, information and we also may obtain further assessments to further evaluate um, the disability. So we can ensure that we are uh, working with the customer and identifying an appropriate Goal, um, because I, I, I know uh, we definitely want to talk about, and um, Javon's going to talk about this, 
but we always want to talk about the goal first and then all of the services to reach that goal. But it's really uh, monumental if we identify a goal first and then those services will um, come into play as we're um, determining how we can support that goal that we've agreed upon. Right, right. Okay, so as you alluded to, the, the, the next step is to develop a plan with the client that details the services that that client will need to reach their employment goal. Can you talk about the types of services that might be included in such a plan and maybe okay. the different ways in which these services are provided? Sure. Um, so that plan is the individualized plan for employment. It's an agreement between the customer and MRS that identifies an employment goal and the services needed to achieve it. So it's a roadmap for guiding that person's journey to employment. The services we provide, as Adriza stated, and we'll, you'll probably hear throughout this discussion, are highly individualized um, to the customer's particular abilities, capabilities, interests, and needs. The counselor and the customer will partner together to explore the jobs the person might like or be good at, uh, then see what the local job market and working conditions might look like, as well as discuss um, that person's disability or functional limitations that may impact employment. So many of the services provided by MRS in the plan are at no cost to the customer. So ex examples of that may include vocational counseling, disability assessment, vocational evaluation, placement services, and uh, trainings in writing cover letters and resumes. In fact, in the Oakland District, we're really excited to be able to provide virtual trainings, such as the mock interviewing workshops. So the MRS customer works with, works with the counselor, I'm sorry, works with the customer, pardon me. The MRS customer works with the counselor to write all or part of the IPE, or Individualized Plan for Employment, and that includes identifying those services to reach the goal, the job goal, identifying the service providers, and it may include who's going to pay for those services. Again, we advise the customer to maintain contact with their counselor if they have any questions at any point of the plan development process. Okay. So, um, and uh, to, to what extent um, are, are services, I guess, that, that would have, or I guess, to what extent are you able to cover equipment or things like that? Like if someone needed assistive technology or needed a, uh, an adaptation to their van for wheelchair accessibility or Something along those lines. Are, are there? Are, are, do you have funds available to to cover those types of things? Oh, oh it. Oh, okay. Yes. You want? You just on. You can go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say because it it really depends. It's not really um, a specific answer to go across the board for that because everything is so individualized and taking into consideration. Uh, not only what that person needs specifically for that to meet that job goal, but what resources are available um, to the person already, uh, what resources or agencies are able to provide it in addition to um, or with MRS. Sometimes the customer is able to contribute to the cost, so it really depends. Um, Adriva, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think you yeah, definitely you summed it up um, wonderfully. And also we want to always go back to, and I uh, alluded to this earlier, that every service must be in support of the goal. Um, and once we're, um, we've are we identified with the customer, the MRS uh, counselor and the customer identifying the appropriate goal, um, those services needed, we will definitely mitigate and discuss um, how we uh, will approach that, but we definitely must consider um, community resources and other comparable benefits that um, can provide such service. But again, it's very individualized, and um, I'm going to keep saying this over. It's not prescriptive, and so um, and um, and no puns for those with a uh, 
uh, when we look at our modifications, we always ask for a prescription. But um, it's, it's not prescriptive, and we are um, definitely working with the customer to help them be as successful as possible. Okay. And, and some of the services uh, that, that may be provided are provided through MRS directly, and others might be contracted with other agencies. Is that correct? Yes, that, that is correct. So we do work with, um, we partner with um, other community agencies to make, to get those services to the customer. Okay, great. So many services provided through MRS are free of charge, but clients may be asked to help pay for some services if financially able. Can you briefly review how those decisions are made? Okay. And again, going back to how the services are very individualized, if a service has been identified in the plan to help the customer reach that uh, vocational goal, then the customer and the MRS counselor will discuss who's going to pay for those services and identify any other comparable benefits, um, what other resources or agencies are out there that might also uh, be able to provide such a service. So if a person is unable to contribute to the cost of a needed service, that doesn't preclude them uh, from receiving the service. But it is something that we discuss uh, while planning. Okay. Um, so after a client reaches their employment goal and finds a job, what does MRS do to help ensure that they maintain that employment? Okay. So once someone is secured employment that's consistent with their um, plan, then MRS will provide follow-along services, regular communication to see how things are going, to make sure the customer is successfully maintaining that job. So at the end of the follow-along period, the case is uh, successfully closed, and you want to consider if that follow-along service, if further follow-along service is needed, um, that will be discussed with the customer prior to closing the case or may have already been discussed when writing the IPE. So it, it is um, possible to get further follow-along services to maintain um, successful employment. Okay, great. Um, I'm sorry, can I add to that? Yeah, please. This is Nasha. So um, that would be the kind of like the – not kind of the job – job seeker counselor role. In the business network division, we also can play a role with retention. Um, let's say someone is employed and they're experiencing some difficulties at their place of employment. A counselor can, you know, work on their side to help them maintain that employment with a follow-along, but maybe it's something that wasn't necessarily identified before. Uh, it could be the person now needs a reasonable accommodation. Maybe the work site, a work site evaluation may be beneficial in order to offer recommendations to that business. Um, maybe that business might need some disability awareness training in order for this employee to be most successful uh, in that work and or, or an assistive technology evaluation. There's a lot of things we can do. The counselor would make a referral to our division, which is a division within MRS. Um, we would work with that business to help that employee maintain work. That being said, our role is very neutral. Um, we're not for the customer or for the business. We're there to provide info. Sometimes positions are not a good fit. Um, a report comes back to the counselor to have that discussion. Sometimes it is talking to the business about what they need to do to implement a reasonable accommodation or to work with that customer where they are not that they can't do the work, but maybe we're just talking about delivering information differently um, and to help the business understand the needs of the customer. Because sometimes our customers, job seeker customers, don't necessarily know how to verbalize what the need is. We can help in that aspect of it, too. Okay, great. And i and, um, just curious, if someone is already employed, maybe they've been employed for five years and, and – now they develop a, a, a disability or their disability worsens to the extent that they are now having difficulties with their employer and with possibly with more accommodations needed or disagreements between the employer and the employee. 
can that person become a vocational rehab or an MRS client at that point when they already have a job so that they can access those services that you provide to, to, to help maintain employment, those kind of mediation services that you described? Or, yes. or can you only – Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and I was going to say, yes. you may hear us all chime in at the same time waiting on the edge of our seat. But, yes, um, Nasha talked, uh, um, you know, very detailed about um, – well, gave a brief um, about how, you know, the business side of it and how they work with those businesses. So those businesses that um, Nasha is working with and even our MRS counselors are working with, they may contact MRS and our business network division and identify an employer or an uh, employee who is uh, having um, some uh, difficulties on the job or may need um, some support on the job. Or also someone may come to us because they heard about us and they, um, they too may need some support in, on the job or have some concerns about their job. But it's never too late. We're, we help with employment. And it's not just preparing and obtaining employment, but it's also retaining employment because we want okay. to make sure that we're capturing those individuals who are successfully employed, not after they exit, but we want to make sure they're employed even further along the line, even after they exit the VR services. So if, they, if anyone is having issues keeping their job um, and uh, they have a disability, then please contact your local MRS office because um, we definitely want to um, work with you and, and, and move you through the eligibility process so we can determine how we can best uh, work with you to help you keep that job. Great. Great. Well, well, I, I, Nasha, I didn't know I didn't, if you wanted I didn't to talk that. about <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. We, um, this is Nasha. So someone can be working in that employee can contact uh, a local office to you know, re-engage or engage in services to retain their employment. And sometimes, as Adriza mentioned, the business itself might reach out to us, um, sometimes in a way to pro be proactive. Sometimes it's because it's the last straw and they heard about us and they really want to know how we can assist. But um, th that that is something we also do. So we do get re direct referrals from businesses who have employees who um, – are experiencing challenges. Now, our program is voluntary, so a business could not force their employee to come to us, but they could highly suggest it. Um, and sometimes they'll do that, and even if the employee doesn't want to work with us, the business will then begin engaging with service with us to see how they can either assist that, um, assist that employee in maintaining their job. And to be honest, uh, sometimes people are not going to keep their job and the businesses want to know, are they doing the right thing legally to exit the person or have the proper protocol because it's just not going to work out? And those are more difficult conversations, but we assist in the, in the business network division. We assist the business with that, too. Um, a lot of businesses, I'm sure you're aware, especially in HR departments, sometimes they are afraid of the legal repercussions if they have to fire an individual with any disability. And that that unknown, especially depending on how long someone has been in HR, they don't know how to handle it, and they'll reach out to us for consultation. So it's for a, a, a myriad of different reasons, but we have the businesses that can come to us for retention support or the employee. Okay. Okay, good to know. So um, can you share a couple of success stories involving clients with epilepsy just to kind of give us an idea of their journey through the process? Okay, sure, I have one. Um, there was a customer who uh, was a young adult, around 22, when he applied for services. Uh, he applied for MRS services to assist with obtaining part-time employment that would supplement and not jeopardize his Social Security benefits and that would also work with his sleep schedule. He needed to wake up naturally as part of seizure prevention. At the time of the intake, he had been seizure-free for about three years and stable on his medic medications. Triggers to his seizures were getting up early and he needed to be able to wake up naturally. At the intake, he didn't have any work history. 
and he had a high school diploma. So guidance and counseling was provided to assist him with career exploration, a community-based work assessment, choosing an appropriate uh, employment goal, and preparation for job placement. He worked, um, he participated in a work adjustment program to work towards increasing his independence, communication, and taking initiative on the job. He then, he and his family received those, um, received Social Security benefits counseling to better understand how employment earnings would impact his benefits. And he attended empowerment training, a pre-employment readiness training to help him prepare for employment, and he also received job placement services to assist him in obtaining employment in line with his skills, interests, abilities, and priorities for employment. Short-term job coaching was provided to help him adjust to, to work and learn his new tasks. Um, retention services were being provided once especially since he was a young adult and this was his first job. And he obtained employment as, a, as an assembly worker, working about 20 hours per week. He was able to work from 11.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., which he loved. And the, his wages from the job supplemented his Social Security check, and that shift allowed him to wake up naturally. So he was happy with the outcome. That's great. Great. Any other, anyone else want to share a, a story? Okay. Well, I think we, we maybe even some of our callers can share success stories too. So we'll, um, we'll, uh, when we get to our Q&A portion, we'll ask if anyone wants to share their experiences. So, um, so no amount of services and training will help a person with epilepsy find and keep a job if they can't rely get to and from that job. So what are some of the strategies you've employed to specifically address the transportation barrier that affects so many people with epilepsy? Hi, this is Adresa. You're right. Many of our customers have identified barriers to employment and transportation is one. Um, some of these barriers are identified when writing the plan for employment, but some are identified in the job search. However, we always want to, again, encourage anyone to please discuss any barriers that you are facing to employment uh, with your MRS counselor. An MRS counselor may be able to provide other resources or other agencies available to assist. Um, for example, what we have, um, we in individuals have, uh, we've done a transportation exploration um, just to see what our are they capable of riding the bus if their um, area has public transportation? Um, we've provided mobility training to help someone learn how to um, catch the bus if their area does have that. We've had individuals who have utilized the support of their community and um, some senior, uh, um, senior uh, community centers have offered uh, to transport individuals back and forth to work. Um, so we definitely work closely with the um, Americans with Disabilities Act uh, coordinator, Mike Patton, over at SMART, and we definitely get him involved so we can see what resources may be available because Mike is very knowledgeable about transportation all over um, the uh, metro area, and so he can definitely give some resources, and he may be able to put us in the right direction if it's someone outside of the uh, metro area, but this is a um, topic that is discussed all across the nation. Michigan is just not, um, you know, uh, you know, I, I, you know, identifying uh, this as a barrier. It's in every uh, a lot of states, and depending on your more rural states, you may find it. It's really a barrier, um, but we definitely work with the customer and we explore their transportation needs. And we come up uh, working with the customer on what may be a best solution for them to get to and from their uh, job, because we definitely, again, we want them to keep their job. Okay. This, this is Asha. Can I add one thing from the business yeah, side? Please. Um, we have actually worked in our division with businesses as they, as the businesses themselves, have tried to establish transportation programs 
within um, their own companies, whether that be like your Michi Van or Rideshare or things like that. Um, and a lot of businesses totally understand how much of a barrier transportation is, but they don't know how to fix it either. Um, there have been some creative collaborations where there's like a group of businesses maybe in an industrial area that were having their own discussions on what they could collectively do to get higher actually from further distances to work within that whole industrial center. Um, the Michivan has been one of the uh, one of the things that has helped, but with the Michivan, someone has to has to be a driver. So it can work, but it could be difficult if someone can't drive. Um, I don't know the exact rules, but there have, I mean, people are, it's like a ride share, so they're sharing the van and responsibility. But even with that, you know, you rely on everyone else. And, you know, there's, if there's an emergency, you have to figure it out to get where you need to go. So uh, even businesses are, are looking at transportation. Um, and when that is something that comes up when I meet with a business, you know, I make sure, you know, when I give that information to the job, to the counselors for their job seekers, they know, that, you know, it's on a bus line or it's not on a bus line. So, you know, this might not be a good fit or there's, a, um, you know, some transportation options available, which does not come along often. But I kind of wanted to just kind of put it out there that businesses also recognize it as a barrier. And some of them are trying some creative practices to try to break that barrier down also. That's great. Right. Yeah, and I imagine some larger businesses might even be able to set up like a a carpool uh, bulletin board or something along those lines where people can say, hey, I'm looking for someone to share a ride with and just post it or post it on via email to the to, to the entire uh, uh, employee base and, and see if, um, if connections are made that way. So great. Um, so in, in your experience, in addition to transportation, what have you found to be some of the biggest barriers to employment for people with epilepsy? And what approaches have you used to help customers get around some of those barriers? Um, I'll discuss this, and I know Nash will probably have definitely some great um, expertise in this as well. But if a customer has experienced a barrier to employment, um, that is disability related. We definitely advise that they discuss that with their MRS counselor um, as the counselor may be able to offer assistance or may be able to refer um, the customer um, to other resources that may be available in their community. So, for example, if someone is, um, has encountered a, a structural uh, barrier, maybe getting to their place of employment, um, maybe even um, getting um, inside the facility that's something that could uh, potentially be covered under the ADA um, and reasonable accommodations that may be offered to that employer, um, offered by that employer and definitely work with the MRS counselor if you um, have dis disclosed that you may um, be able to perform your job with or without a reasonable accommodation. So definitely uh, work with that um, and um, I have an employee uh, personally right at Michigan Rehab Services, and um, the employee was definitely um, had some trepidations about uh, receiving some assistive technology to be able to perform her job. And um, with, you know, just uh, the care and the discussions and um, even from her end as being a rehab counselor, uh, just having that discussion, she definitely um, had an eye opener. Said, "Wow, this is what my customers must be going through." And it's having those honest conversations about what do you need to be successful to do your job. Having the accommodation does not stigmatize you because, at the end of the day, no one at my job is writing, um, you know, uh, the the payment for me, and um, we have to be able to all be able to perform our job. And if you go into your local fast food restaurant and you can see they can press a burger on the screen or they can do that, and that was probably developed by someone who needed an accommodation to perform their job. And now it's the accommodations have led to making it easy and convenient and efficient for everyone to perform their job. 
So if um, you've identified that you are having an issue or concern, or you may not even know you're having an issue or concern, our occupational therapist with Business Network Division can go and do a worksite evaluation to determine um, what may be some assistive technology or some um, possible solutions to help you be able to perform your job. And Nasha, um, I know you may want to speak to this as well. Yes, I was going to speak to it though from my experience as a counselor in working with individuals with epilepsy specifically. The one thing that came up often, I apologize for my outside noise. I left the inside of the house because my kids were in there and I came outside and they're cutting grass. So I'm no, so okay. sorry. <laughs> um, one of the things that came up often was anxiety and the fear of having a seizure in public, um, not feeling safe, not knowing what would happen if they did have a seizure because they weren't driving. Um, if they were using public transportation and they had a seizure, would anyone help them? You know, would someone rob them? It was it was some a lot of anxiety around that, and then the depression that was associated with just almost not being able to live freely without that fear. So with with the couple of customers that I did have, um, and that was a theme with two of the three for sure. You know, they had I recommended that they start counseling to address those issues. Um, with one in particular, he was not even familiar with the Epilepsy Foundation, so I connected him with the foundation. I actually paid for him to attend a conference. He didn't even want to get in the transportation we decided to get there, but he did. Um, so I tried to model for him engaging and interacting because he felt very isolated. Um, he was young. He was, I think, 27 at the time, and this was, I don't know, probably 10 years ago. But he might have been 27, 28 at the time, and he just felt like he didn't have a social life, he didn't have friends, um, and he didn't know what to do with that. So the anxiety and fear that went together, he was depressed, he felt very socially isolated. Um, he ended up connecting with the Epilepsy Foundation. He went to the conference. Um, you know, I was modeling how to engage in conversation for him, so he started having those conversations with other people. And that was what kind of helped him feel better. But he had so much fear around the what if that it was paralyzing for him. Um, and the other customer I worked with, too, that anxiety and depression was was pretty significant. And a lot of that was because of their, their, their epilepsy was not stable at all. And they never knew when something might happen. So other than the the... the, the um, supports I tried to provide to them and those resources, which did help. Um, I think that is something, is helping someone recognize, okay, you don't have to be alone in this. There are resources. There are uh, organizations you can connect with because some people just don't know, and they don't know they don't know. So we can bridge that gap to help people get better and also move into employment and social experiences and to have a, a – so they don't feel it's just me, so that connectivity with other people experiencing the same thing. Great. Yeah, those are really good examples um, and certainly can appreciate that the anxiety and depression can be a, a major barrier uh, and a common one among people with epilepsy. Um, along those lines, um, another co common uh, – challenge with epilepsy is um, memory problems and other other cognitive difficulties that can you know interfere with work to some extent um, have you found any particular um, referrals or or job coaching uh, specifically related to that that can that can help like um for example if someone has has received a job and is having trouble remembering the steps of, of the things that they're supposed to do, can a job coach, you know, assigned through MRS help them to develop strategies for, um, you know, to remember the steps of the process or that sort of thing? This is Nasha. A job coach may assist in the beginning. Um, a, mm -hmm. a therapy, ongoing therapy may be a benefit. But more than anything, I think um, looking at reasonable accommodations and techniques that can be put in place specific to that job would be most helpful. 
So if someone is in a setting, let's say they work, let's pick one, pick Quicken Loans. They work for Quicken Loans. They go to work every day. They know how to do their job. A new process is introduced, and they're having difficulty learning it. Maybe it's just a task sheet or a checklist or something like that to keep them on track. Or maybe they're using timers or alarms to help, um, you know, with memory, you know, staying on task or completing a task. Um, definitely discussing it with management and HR to discuss the possibility of reasonable accommodation. There are so many things that are low-tech reasonable accommodations, a, a sheet of paper with a checklist, you know, printing your daily schedule out, highlighting it, are, are all things you can do just really quick up to very sophisticated things with, you know, beeps and lights and alarms and flashing on a screen. So a job coach may help in the basics of establishing a routine, but a counselor can help someone establish a routine or a referral to B&D and working with that employee and employer and looking at the position description and what's required can help establish a routine. So I think there's lots of options for it. It's going to be very specific to the memory loss and how it is affecting the functional limitations on the job in order to determine what that will look like for that person. Mm-hmm. And that's it, yes. And I, I, I'm glad you said about the low cost and uh, using the resources um, that they have. So uh, I'm dating myself uh, with this example, but pre, um, you know, the popularity of the iPhone, I had a customer when I was working with, um, and he um, had identified as um, having a seizure disorder. And um, he was, uh, he could easily uh, find a job because his resume spoke uh, to the skill set that he brought to any company. Um, the uh, challenge was once he got on the job, the memory issues. And this was a very um, professional, um, you know, high-wage job. And so he was very concerned that um, his colleagues, again, talking about that stigma, would know that he has some memory issues. And so the app, the Apple uh, phone had just came out, and I said, you know, I've been hearing about these apps on an Apple phone that you can download to help you with some memory issues once you um, get on the job because this particular customer um, had difficulties remembering names um, and uh, inadvertently sent a report to the wrong, uh, I'll, I'll say Susan, for example, and uh, it was a confidential report, and uh, the hires up did not like that. So we just created a little uh, mnemonic uh, uh, method uh, for him to remember uh, who he's supposed to send a report to and what he uh, what is he supposed to send in that report, and just double checking to make sure he's sending it to the right Susan um, in that. And uh, he has uh, been very successful. He works for right now a Fortune 500 company, um, and uh, you know he's very successful. He keeps in touch with me regularly to let me know how he's doing um, and uh, just uh, the strides that he's made. Uh, pre-morbidity of the uh, diagnosis of the seizure disorder. So, again, as Nasha discussed, if there are so many different options, but just even at that time with, with me doing some research and, and getting the involved of our occupational therapist, I'm like, there's, there's these things called apps, and we can download an app, and it, it was just great. And uh, so there's some, there's, that's a low-cost option, um, and, and he was just so pleased that, we were able to help him rectify that concern because that was one of his biggest anxieties on a job was remembering who he's supposed to submit a report to and things like that. So that's just an example, but Nash also had great suggestions um, as well. Great. And then so you mentioned you have occupational therapists on staff at, at your office or at MRS? I was going to get into that when it got to some of the business stuff, if you want to wait or – Okay, no, that. that's fine. We, we, we can wait for that. Um, okay. But, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's good to know if that's the case. Um, so I'm as glad the case that with... I'm educating you guys about Michigan Rehab Services. And, um, you know, again, this is not exhaustive questions or uh, cover every facet um, intended of our program. But, again, definitely, you know, um, reach out to your local office, and Javon will talk about that later, and um, we'll definitely um, – 
you know, try to help you as best as possible. Great, great. So um, as is the case with physicians and psychologists and other health and human service professionals, the outcomes for a person receiving services depend in part on the quality of the provider and the strength of that provider-client relationship. Um, so if someone's not satisfied with the particular vocational rehabilitation counselor assigned to them through their local office, do they have a right to request a new one? And how would you suggest finding a new counselor in that in this case? Yeah, yeah, this is Idris. I'll speak to this from a manager's perspective because um, I definitely uh, have my fair share of dealing with this. But um, as with any relationship, uh, the counselors, as you heard Joanne talk about the and, and now she even talked about the level of education of our counselors. The goal is to really build that rapport with the customer. Sometimes it's a, a fit and sometimes it is just not a fit. Um, however, we want to make sure that the counselor is being fair, uh, treating the customer with dignity and respect, um, and, and, and really uh, being, uh, being honest and, and, and trustworthy and all of those things that um, I definitely pride myself in my ethical creed. Um, and so when it's determined that um, by maybe no mean of the uh, provider or the, the counselor, or um, the client, sometimes it's just not a good relationship. And so if, they, if anyone is not satisfied with their um, vocational rehabilitation program, I strongly encourage them to please contact um, their overseeing site manager um, for assistance. And again, I've talked about the appeals process. Everyone, um, applicant or eligible person, have the right to appeal decisions. And um, I also referenced earlier um, contacting the client assistance program um, to be that media, uh, to be that advocate and, and to help mediate um, any decisions that are being made. But just with any relationship, it's about building rapport, but sometimes um, the um, relationship may have been uh, severed. And so uh, we definitely want to identify that. But at the end of the day, um, we want to make sure that we're working with that customer on reaching their um, employment goal and being successful. Okay, great. And and if someone, let's say someone has a, a friend who used MRS and it was at a different office than their local office, and they said, oh, I had this great experience with this particular counselor. Could someone seek out that counselor even if they weren't from their local office? It, each office is um, – different in how they uh, take their referrals. Everyone, again, okay. has the right to apply for services. There's uh, no guarantee so, um, you're going to get that, so I'll speak in, in my office because uh, that's who I supervise. But um, as Javon, she's assigned to um, the Epilepsy Foundation in Nashville. When she was a counselor, she worked with them as well. Um, so it depends on the referral and uh, the referral source. Um, and also um, the manager assignment, um, but we do take that into consideration. It's great to hear that, you know, someone had a great relationship with um, one particular counselor, but, I, you know, I like to say I pride myself in all my counselors being able to provide a good job, and if that's not the case, then we definitely need to talk about it, um, but most definitely, um, you know, if, again, going back to um, the request for a new counselor appealing, um, it, it's basically, does this uh, counselor, are they um, moving you along in the VR process as appropriate? And um, if any disagreements that are unresolved, has the site manager been involved in that um, is always what I ask um, in, in the process. So, again, all of my counselors are great counselors and uh, and, I, and, you know, I can probably speak for the great state uh, as well of all the MRS counselors, um, but I only, I know about my old park staff, but, I, you know, most definitely all of them um, are, are there to do a job, and if it's not getting done, then definitely get the manager involved. Okay, great. So uh, MRS also works extensively with the school system and to provide pre-employment transition services. Can you review the, the major types of services you offer through this and explain how and when students can access those services? Sure. Um, so pre-employment services are provided 
to our students uh, with disabilities ages 14 to 26. And there are five major types of the services that we offer. Uh, they are job exploration, where the students learn about different jobs and what skills they might need to get those jobs. Work-based learning experiences, um, those are activities to learn about the workplace, what, um, what that might include would be participating in the job shadow, touring uh, various work sites, or participating in a trial work experience. Um, also, counseling on post-secondary education, where the students learn about options for continued education and training after high school. Another one is workplace readiness training, where students learn about and gain skills to be ready for employment. And lastly, um, self-advocacy training and peer mentoring, where the students learn about the skills to advocate for themselves and how to request accommodations that they need to be accessible, successful. So the pre-employment is part of the, is the start of vocational rehabilitation services. So we encourage our students to speak with an MRS counselor to determine if more individualized services are needed. So if any um, students are interested in connecting or if anyone was interested in connecting a student with MRS, they can be referred by the school system or the parent or agency to, and contact MRS directly. Okay, is there, is there a separate eligibility process for that or is it available to anyone who has an IEP, for example, or a 504 plan? Is there, I guess, how, how do people, how do students and, and parents know that they can, whether they can access those services? So for the pre-employment uh, services, it would be a student who has a disability. So generally those students do have um, a 504 plan or an um, IEP, uh, but other documentation may be provided to determine eligibility for those services. Okay. Um, and what's, what is the Michigan Career and Technical Institute and how can someone access the services that they offer? Oh, sure. Um, Michigan Career and Technical Institute, or MCTI, it's a training program operated by MRS. Uh, it's one of eight uh, training programs in the nation for people with disabilities. Um, we offer 13 training programs, um, for example, automotive, culinary arts, uh, pharmacy tech, just to name a few. Um, MCTI offers a unique blend of support services and state-of-the-art training for jobs that are needed in business and industry today. So if anyone was interested in pursuing training at MCTI, they just need to let the MRS counselor know. And there is actually a website um, at michigan.gov slash MCTI where they can schedule a virtual tour and get more information about um, participating in that programming and that training. Okay, is, there, is this a residential program or is it uh, do people commute to, to receive those services or, or are both options available? Those services are provided on site. Um, it's in uh, Pine Lake, which is um, in Southwest Berry County, so it is far from um, here, about two, a little over two hours uh, to get there. So it is a residential program unless you live close to that area and, and can go back and forth. But generally, for most of the participants, they stay on campus. Um, so with that, um, right now, that's not an option because we are working remotely. So MCTI has offered some programming virtually, and so the, the participants are receiving their instruction online right now. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, presumably there are costs for, for for room and board, and for uh, are there also costs for the, the coursework, or is any of that covered by any entity? It is covered by MRS, although the um, participants are required to um, apply for financial aid to see if there's any um, any coverage through 
state or federal funds, but it is uh, funded strictly through um, or is funded by MRS, so there would okay. not be a cost to the customer. Great. Um, can you quickly describe Michigan Work and explain the extent to which MRS coordinates its services with this agency? And is it common for someone to receive services from both agencies? Uh, yes. Um, Michigan uh, Works is a core uh, partner with Michigan Rehab Services. Um, we are both housed under the Labor and Economic Opportunity, um, the State of Michigan Department. And all Michigan Works offices has an MRS counselor assigned to work with uh, individuals with disabilities. Javon is actually assigned uh, a counselor assigned to two local MRS offices. So I'll let her talk about her role uh, there as the assigned counselor at two local um, MRS offices in Oakland County. And also Nasha um, can most definitely speak to the business service relationships and um, the, mutual, the mutuality that we work together in um, servicing our business customers. So I'll let Javon talk about on her end how, um, her role at Michigan Works. Okay. So for me, I have two Michigan Works locations. Uh, one is in Oak Park and one is in Southfield, Michigan. So what I do, I coordinate um, services with the career advisors there. If they have any customers who um, have disabilities and need additional support services, they uh, contact me or put me, um, I come over to meet with that person to discuss the supports and services that MRS offers and we can actually work together with MRS to help that person achieve their employment goals. Um, sometimes we offer uh, trainings and workshops um, or supports that um, Michigan Works does not have and sometimes they have trainings and workshops that we refer our customers to go over and participate in. So it, it is a, a beautiful collaboration that we have. And right now that we're all working remotely, we share our different virtual workshops um, to our customers so that they're still getting those services to help them prepare for or maintain employment. Great, great. And just to clarify for anyone who doesn't know, Michigan Works is available to anyone who's seeking employment, employment assistance regardless of whether you have a disability. So. Yes. And then Nasha? So with Michigan Works having their kind of two sides of the house, their job seeker side and their business side, um, MRS has now modeled that to have the dual customer. So on my side, I work with the business solutions professionals as they engage with and interact with businesses that they are creating relationships with, um, we work we walk shoulder to shoulder. So if they are working with the business and, and a conversation comes up about, um, you know, returning to work or people going off on short-term disability or reasonable accommodations, typically they will connect with me or, or any of the BRCs across the state to work together with that business to address whatever that need is. Sometimes it's, it's nothing big. It can be just having a conversation. Sometimes it's helping them um, develop an entire diversity and inclusion program or ongoing training. Um, and then we also will work collaboratively with Mission Work with recruitment efforts for that business. So we are essentially, um, you know, Russ, as you mentioned, they have to work with anyone regardless if they have a disability or not. But we will work together collaboratively provide um, our expertise of disability to that business that Michigan Work is working with. Okay, great. And uh, while we're on that topic, Nasha, I know you've, you've, you've mentioned a lot of, of about your services that uh, you provide directly to employers. Was there anything else that you wanted to touch on um, about those services, um, anything that you haven't covered yet? Yes, that in our, within our division, we do have occupational therapists who work with um, our job seeker customers and the businesses. Um, so when referrals are made to our division, if the person is working, um, a consultant or someone in my role alongside of, uh, occupational therapists are assigned to that case to see what, if any, business services might be needed um, or what 
uh, business services that business may require, whether it's related to one specific employee or just their organization as a whole. Or um, a referral can be made from a counselor in a district office to our division specifically for occupational therapy assistance services. And those can include a lot of things, but um, our OTs assist with return to work strategies, job maintenance approaches, injury prevention and wellness, wellness programming, um, assistive technology and services, uh, job restructuring and work site adjustments. So we all do this within our roles, but the OTs typically do it more. But within our role, we, as, as consultants working with the businesses, we will help the businesses with their talent development, connection to partner assets and services. So if I'm working with a business who may be expanding, maybe I'm connecting them with uh, MEDC, Michigan Economic and Development Corporation, or it might be EEOC because something's come up and they need to, you know, have a contact. It could be Michigan Works because they aren't working with them. <clears throat> Excuse me. It could be MCCI because there might be a pipeline, pipeline development from program to employment. Um, and then we all assist with the accommodation services and the ADA services that we provide are the consultation guidance and education. Um, we facilitate customized disability awareness training and also windmills, which is a trademark disability awareness training to businesses, organizations, so not just your for-profits, non-profits, you know, pretty much any entity. And we do ADA architectural guideline site assessments. So for those businesses that are trying to make sure they are compliant as it relates to their actual site. So um, do they have the right signage? Are, are doors opening and closing appropriately? We do those evaluations and then provide that report to the business to make updates as necessary. That kind of is a nutshell of what we do. I mean, we do more, but that's like on paper. <laughs> um, <So long. laughs> yeah. Great. So, but our OTs are instrumental in, in working with the business customers, as well as our job seeker customers, just to help both sides to be prepared to enter and maintain work. Okay. And does um, MRS maintain a list of employers that have a strong track record of hiring people with disabilities um, or epilepsy specifically? And can, if so, can anyone access that information or only MRS clients? So we, um, you know, within MRS, like Javon has a case management system she uses to record the information of the job seeker customer. In our division, the B&D, we have a case management system that we use to record the information of the business customer. So just like the job seeker customer, no one has access to it unless you work within MRS. It's the same with the business customer. Um, sometimes when we're working with businesses, there could be some things going on that aren't public knowledge or some expansions or businesses coming into the area that can't be shared because, you know, they're under development. So the information that we have for our businesses is just as protected as the information we have from our customers. We have the database. We don't share it externally, but we use our relationships and connections to share job leads or postings with uh, the job seekers and the, and the counselors in the district. So if someone came and, and said, you know, I'll have someone who has this many years' experience, to be honest with us, the disability doesn't matter because we cannot be a vehicle of discrimination. If someone is qualified and has the skills and knowledge and abilities and they want to do the work, then we're going to try to make that a good connection. Um, we don't want to place someone just because they have X disability. So we we will try to make those connections and develop those relationships so that we know going in, you know, the, the organization is aware of what we do, their understanding of, of our customers and some of the functional limitations that may be involved with hiring them, but they're open to working with us and, you know, making it a good collaboration and a good fit for that customer. Okay, great. Um, and lastly, can, can you uh, briefly explain the vocationally handicapped provision of the Workers' Disability Compensation Act? and why yes. clients with epilepsy maybe should get certified through that provision. So, in order to explain it, there's a little history behind it. So, the Vocationally Handicapped Law um, is part of Public Act 183, 
which was uh, originated in 1971. So this is pre-ADA. So this was almost like a, not almost, it was a way for someone that had um, very specific disabilities that included back, heart, epileptic, or diabetic conditions, that when they were hired, they would have to have this um, second injury cert or vocational handicap certification in hand, and they actually ended up, they had that made them disclose their disability on the front end, that this, I have this disability, um, here's like my card, and what that card does, the law limits the employer's liability for workman's compensation benefits only for 52 weeks of benefits for any work-related injury. If a, someone is working and they have this in place and there's an injury, the employer only pays for one year of benefits for workman's comp. After that, funding is paid out of um, – uh, the employer is reimbursed through the second injury fund. So with that being said, before ADA, pre-ADA, this kind of was the protection that – individuals with these four uh, diagnoses had when they went to work. So in 1990, when the ADA was established and then amended in 2008, it almost, it's just, I'm not going to say it eliminates it, but there's probably not going to be any employer who says, I'm not going to hire you because you have epilepsy or a heart condition or a back injury or because you're diabetic. So... In order for an employer today under the ADA to kind of utilize the vocationally handicapped law, they would have to write a letter saying that they won't hire because of the injury, or they would write something saying they require a second injury certification. So a lot of employers are not aware that this is something that is available um, because most just fall under the ADA. The ADA expanded and enhanced and, and gave a lot more provisions to, you know, all disabilities legally, and it is much more robust than the second injury or the vocationally handicapped law was. So if a, someone with epilepsy wanted to get certified, could they? Absolutely. The thing about it is it doesn't necessarily mean um, that the business is going to want to say um, the business might not know what it is or how to utilize it or how it works. Um, and ultimately, if you have this on hand, you are disclosing your disability up front right. because it's something that has to be presented but at hire. You couldn't work for three months and say, oh, yeah, I found out about this um, vocationally handicapped law. I want to give you my form. This has to be there at the time of hire. So that means the person would have to disclose their disability at hire to present this. It, it, it may be beneficial. It may not. I guess it would depend on that person. But really, with the ADA being so much more of an expanded and robust law, um, it is uh, it's kind of antiquated, but it is still around. So that is definitely a personal option. But with this uh, vocationally handicapped law, comes disclosure at or prior to hire, which a lot of people I know, still, you know, don't want to do that. Um, sure, sure. So I don't, I, I wouldn't advise either way. I think if it's something someone is considering specific to epilepsy, it is a conversation to have with their counselor and kind of to do a pro-con list to see what that's going to look like and to see where their comfort level is in actually disclosing that um, at hire. Okay, great. Well, um, just given the time, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to questions. So if everyone can just hold for a second. Okay, who would like to get us started with a question? I have a question. This is Christine yeah. Lisbring. Um, you had mentioned uh, uh, problems with uh, memory problems and your workarounds for them that there are several different things that you can do. Um, and I wondered, uh, is there also a problem with word finding in, with epilepsy? I wondered if you have any, any of you have any experience with things that help with that or um, any, anything that, any thoughts on it? This, this is Nasha. 
Um, off the top of my head, to be honest, I can't think of anything, but I'm writing a little note, and I can follow up with Russ or Javon can send this over just if there's some ready available apps um, or things I'll, I can consult with the OTs. I will say one thing to consider if you have not ever heard of it or utilized it would be the Job Accommodations Network because there are great resources on there. And within JAN, if it's not online, like in the in the list, they um, provide accommodation, job accommodations specific to disability or functional limitation. And if you don't see it in there, you can always contact them directly. And they, I've every time I've called them, um, if something wasn't available, they've helped me find the resource or the device or the uh, assistive technology that would kind of fill that gap. But I can. I can look into it and get that back to uh, Javon to get to rest, if, if, if that's okay. And this Job Accommodations Network, is this through MRF? No, that is through the Department of Labor and the Office of Disability Employment Policy. So their website is ask, A-S-K, J-A-N, guys, is it .org or .com? Well, it's it's dot org. I'm looking at it. Okay. <laughs> but it's ask, A-S-K-J-A-N. J as in and jam. J as in job, yes, A as in apple. Yeah, dot org. J as in yeah, J as in. Uh, yeah, go ahead and knock. I'm sorry. Um, J as in job, A as in apple, N as in nancy, dot org. And they are a website that is um, – is, is, I don't know, what's the word? It's a part of the Department of Labor Office of Disability Employment Policy. So it's a federal okay. website. Yep. Thank you. Uh huh. And, and another thing related to that, Christine, is um, that, that's one of the rare situations where it, it's at least worth considering um, disclosing epilepsy in a job interview. In many cases, we would advise against that because it's just much easier to discriminate against someone in a job interview or in the hiring process than in other areas along uh, along the job process. Um, but if you're having difficulty with word finding um, during a, a job interview, uh, that's something where knowing that this is a medication side effect or knowing that it's related to epilepsy but does not reflect your overall ability to function might be better than an employer making assumptions about it, if that makes sense. And, Russ, you know, when, when someone requests a reasonable accommodation, especially during an interview, um, you don't uh, you don't necessarily have to tell them what the diagnosis is. You need to just mm -hmm. discuss what the functional limitation is. So if you have a doctor that writes up, you know, has difficulty finding words or, or however they word it, may need questions beforehand or be able to review the questions prior to the interview or what, you know, whatever that accommodation could look like. Um, because it's not like you're giving them your whole medical file. A lot of businesses actually, if someone needs an accommodation, they'd rather have it in place um, because it, it kind of goes to, is this person any qual even qualified because of X, Y, Z and assumptions being made versus, oh, they need an accommodation, they're going to be much better because this is in place, which is definitely a personal, you know, a personal choice. Yeah, definitely. But I know from the business side, businesses are like, well, if they need an accommodation, just let me know. We'll, we'll put it in place. So it's, it's, it's almost a catch-22. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, other questions. We've got a, a couple more minutes. Uh, yeah, Ross, this is Karen. Yeah. Um. I just wanted to let everybody there know, and when all of you people that with epilepsy and everything, I, of course, am epileptic, but back a few years ago, uh, my father suggested I go to a rehabilitation center, and I wrote down everything, you know, filled out the forms and stuff. I love taking care of people. And the very next day, I got a phone call to be a direct care worker in a group home. And they paid for my classes, everything. 
and I've always wanted to thank them for helping me find a job because I was a paramedic for a while. Also, um, the group home I was working in, um, my boss hit me across the face, and I didn't go on to go back to work there, so rehab found another location of a group home for me. And I'm, in, I'm still in contact with three of my group homes. I help them do artwork and stuff, and now I volunteer in hospitals. So I've always wanted to thank you people for finding my job I really wanted. And look at here, we had this whole time a success story right on the phone. That is so awesome. <laughs> oh, Wonderful. No. So glad to hear that. Well, that you awesome. used to have an office uh, south of Detroit in Wyandotte. Yep. And mm -hmm. that's where I went. Oh, wow. So glad to so hear that. Thank I still take care that. of people. Yeah, I still do it. I take care of people with epilepsy or that have MS or a mentally handicapped. Oh, I have goosebumps. That's such a good story. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Go outside to get rid of the goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, <laughs> so uh, would, would you uh, – I just want to make sure – I know we, we didn't have a lot of time for questions. Would uh, our panelists be willing to stand for just a couple more minutes in case anyone else has a question that they haven't had a chance to ask? Yes, this is Nasha. I'm fine with being on. Okay. Yes. Let me, I just want to put it out there again. Uh, if, if anyone has a question that they have had a chance to ask, uh, does, does, does anyone have something they'd like to ask with the last few minutes that we have remaining? I would. This is Matt Miller. Okay. Um, I don't know where to start, but I've, I lost my job this year. I work on a golf course, and when I went in to check on my job for this year, the supervisor told me that I'm a liability, and he told me that I can't start the equipment that I work with. And at that time, I didn't know where where well, where to go to, but then on the other hand, my doctor told me I had to have surgery also for my VNS, but with this COVID-19, it's been put off, so I'm not really sure, I didn't know if I should go back next year and try apply for my job again, or what? How should I go about it? Drop it, or what? Well, I what? Mean, this, this sounds <laughs> like a, a, a situation where where you know scheduling an appointment with your local your local MRS office to discuss the situation and see if you'd be eligible for services and and then how they could help you to get that job back or to, to, you know, work with that employer to be able to work there again or to find similar work uh, or uh, that would involve similar skills or have a similar um, schedule or that type of thing. Um, our panelists, do you want to uh, jump in on that? Um, I have just one question, and I'm just going to ask the question and then leave it there. But if it if you feel you were wrongfully terminated because of your disability, you have options with also contacting the EEOC, right. which I believe you have a year to file from the date of the incident if you want to pursue it. Other than that, I would say or ask another question. If, if your doctor feels you can work now, although you have a pending surgery, then I'd say, you know, contact an office and and, uh, and 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 try to get into services. If your doctor's like, we want to wait for you to do anything until after, and you're not really released to work, then you may want to wait until after that. So some of this, without knowing, um, you know, those are options, but if you feel you were wrongfully terminated because of your disability, 
you can contact the EEOC. Are there any offices in Monroe County? There, there's an office in Monroe. There is an office okay. in Monroe. Mm-hmm. You get that, Matt? Well, yeah, I heard that. It says uh, <laughs> you said something about 60 days, and this job I, I'm on is kind of like a seasonable job. It's on the golf course. Mm-hmm. So... Um, so we, so we will definitely stick- take that into yeah we'll take that in consideration, and um, being that you are employed um, or having some issues from the VR side, we consider that to be a job in jeopardy, um, and so we do want to come in and um, help. Uh, many jobs are seasonal, um, but uh, people have been uh, successfully employed with seasonal employment. Uh, for years, and that is just like their livelihood. Um, and so we definitely want to take that into consideration um, and ensure that you are working to your uh, fullest potential also. But we do want to come in, and if you're having those issues on the job, work with you and, and you know, our, our NASH, our business uh, consultant is on the job. I mean, on the phone as well, sorry. Um, and she's on the job to help you. <laughs> um, but... Um, you know, definitely um, contact your MRS office and let's see. And um, I heard someone ask about Monroe, so I'm assuming you live in Monroe, and so there is an office in Monroe. So yes, I do. Reach, yeah, so please reach out to your local MRS office um, so that um, they can come in and start uh, providing those services. And with the EEOC, it protects full-time, part-time, seasonal, temporary employees and you have uh, 180 or 300 I think it's 365 with the EEOC to file because it's 180 with uh, Department of Civil Rights so you're protected you're covered and if, if for some reason you apply and you get denied because it's outside of the time frame you'll know that but it is definitely longer than 60 days okay and is, okay. is there a, a limit on the number of you have to have, does the employer have to have a certain number of employees to qualify for EE, to be covered under the ADA? Yes, for EEOC, it is 15 employees. For Michigan Department of Civil Rights, it's one or more. Oh, okay. So some people who can't file under EEOC can file a complaint under the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. Okay. Yeah, I get that. Good to know. Great. All right. Well, given the time, I, I, we do have to wrap it up. So I think I appreciate you staying on a little bit longer. So thank you so much to our our uh, panelists for for a really great and comprehensive discussion of of vocational rehab services and um, and I definitely anyone who is uh, having difficulties with work or or considering trying to find employment and having some difficulties related to their disability, certainly reach out to your um, local MRS office because, uh, as, you, as you've learned today, hopefully a lot of different uh, options and services available there. So thank you so much. And they are and if very anyone has any, Indeed, you. indeed. So, so anyone uh, who has any additional questions, please. Call us at 1-800-377-6226 or visit our website at epilepsymichigan.org. Have a good evening, everyone, and thanks again to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. Bye, Rob.